turned on this computer, okay. All right, everybody, we have Christine and Heather here and I'm recording because I want to talk a little bit about module two and um, I think it's fair to share what I'm saying about module two with all of you. So I'm gonna share a screen. Poor Christine has been through this with me once already, so it's not my forte. And then I'm trying to look at the learning modules. Here we go. Okay, so for module two, I was talking to Christine already a bit about the discussion board, but I really wanna emphasize for the discussion board, you know, SNU always tells you what you're supposed to do exactly. So in your initial post, you're literally comparing and contrasting one scenario from Atwood with the whole story from Vonnegut. And in that, you're gonna say, which of the conflicts do you find more engaging? The one scenario you pick from Atwood or the whole story from Vonnegut? And they kind of give you a hint about, I mean, and a lot of people find Atwood more engaging, but they give you a hint that says, how does fleshing out the details of a plot line as Vonnegut does change the way you perceive actions and characters? So like Atwood's is very basic, but it's a really amazing kind of craft journey short story where she's saying these different things could happen. And by the way she presents them to you, you kind of understand the fictional elements she's adding into each scenario help change the way that you perceive them. So I think that the course designers are wanting you to see that. And so it's asking you to answer that question. Then it says, and this is always one of those great clues that SNU gives you as you answer, identify specific details. That's like, quote from the text, quote from the text. So be quoting from Vonnegut um, what is effective in fleshing out the story's conflict. So that's where you're being told to quote from Vonnegut. If you haven't um, subscribed to the general questions, please do because that's where I describe what my expectations are in discussion boards. And you'll see that I'm a lot of times looking for an outside expert. In this course, I do count the textbooks, appendix or appendices um, from charters as outside resources. And so using her and what she has to say does count. But also, you know, if you have a viable blog, master classes, you just have to make sure that the person really is a quality, like writing persona. And I was talking to Christine about how um, writers really have to monetize everything they're doing. So in the academic world, we would never take a commercial website, but in the creative writing world, you almost have to because, you know, not very many people make very much money off of writing. So monetizing their websites is one way they, they do. So those are the things you do in your initial post that's due by Thursday. And then for your response to your peers, you think about Atwood's call for try how and why, which is basically what you're doing with your story. And then you talk about how the details the classmates identified. So when you look at their initial compare and contrast of Atwood and Vonnegut, um, how have those details identified the how and why, the call for the how and why. And that's what you need to do for the discussion boards. The three short story scenes, this is your um, milestone one. So you'll find that we're having um, Zoom meetings on the Saturdays before you have a week where the milestone is your project in that week. And it's very handy that way because the creative writing we're gonna do here often will apply to what you're doing for your project. Um, so in this case, you've already done the three I mean, you're proposing your three stories. So the final project in this class is completing one story. This next week, you're gonna put three proposed short stories and you're gonna choose from one of those. Once you choose it, that's your story and we are writing it and revising it for the rest of the class. So choose wisely. <laughs> is that an Indiana Jones, isn't it? You should choose wisely. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so in this case, you're proposing a one paragraph summary of what the whole story would be, and you need to include the spoiler. Like, don't do, you know, a teaser, like a, a movie teaser or a teaser to read a book. This is saying what the whole story is, including how it ends, and then give us an example of it, like a one paragraph example of writing from the story. Most people usually start in the beginning, like they just write the first paragraph of the story, but you can choose from wherever in the story you wanna be writing part of it. And then after you, so that's what you submit to me. And then also when you submit it for the critical peer review discussion, you wanna add a couple of 
two to three specific questions you want feedback on. Meaning usually this one, like one, which one should I choose in your opinion, but also why? So like, what was it about the scenarios that you wrote that made one more compelling than others to your peers? Does that make sense? Do you all have any questions? No. No. Okay. And Heather, I know that, I mean, like if you're in your gabillionth term at SNU, you already know that the discussion boards are very specific. Um, but I just want to emphasize for everybody, like this is true in all of your classes, all the way through SNU. They tell you exactly what you're supposed to do for the discussion boards. And if you pay attention to like critical peer review, the same type of thing is happening. So just, you know, uh, reading SNU's assignments, you learn that it's a, it's a practice in like, you know, understanding what SNU is asking you to do is all. And my announcements do the best to interpret that for you as well. So hopefully, hopefully you'll succeed. <laughs> but the first please, person I've had so far that has been very honest about this. Like everyone is just like, here you go, read it. <laughs> oh, um, well, I mean, I, I guess, I guess because um, my job is to interpret the courses that the course designers need. And I want to be sure you understand that, like, they give me a rubric to grade from what you see. And so, you know, I am very channeled into how you receive your grades. And of course, that's my interpretation, but I want to tell you how I'm interpreting it. So you have your best success for the grades. And then I, I want to say that I do believe in the system that they're using. Like, they, they have course designers who are trying to create assignments and grading that will improve your writing. So it's not... Like I'm trying to help you get a good grade, but in trying to get a good grade, they've designed something that should improve your writing if you're following their system. So the two things, yeah, right. And then I try to help you meet in the middle. So typically, and I guess what I need to emphasize also is when you do a larger milestone project, well, I think I do this for all the milestones. I give audio feedback normally um, because I can talk to you in, in like say five minutes of talking, I can do way more then I can give you by typing. And so if you don't want audio feedback, just let me know. If it doesn't work for you, let me know. And I will give you written feedback. I mean, there's no reason that I can't change the method I do. But so far, my feedback and my, I don't know, I think I'm in my fourth or fifth term of teaching this class. The feedback is, oh, I love the audio feedback because I get so much more. Um, plus, you can hear my enthusiasm because I love reading everybody's creative writing. I'm just amazed by people's creativity. But anyway, so... Um, if audio feedback doesn't work, please let me know. But also then when I'm giving that audio feedback, I'm talking, you know, through the expertise that I have with creative writing in my own world, that part of the feedback, I think is where, where I can help you push your creative writing even farther. Um, and it still matches in, I still am talking about the categories, you know, it's going to be uh, narrative arc, character development, um, setting description, setting sensory detail, and um, I always think of it as figurative language, but that's rhetorical devices. Just figurative language is my favorite of the rhetorical devices. So I'll be talking in those areas, but I'm emphasizing the things that, you know, in my other experiences through being at Pennington and being an editor with Birch Park and like all the things that I'm doing, I feel like that's where I can help push more, even though we're following the rubrics. I'm definitely talking about contemporary things I know about writing. So I hope it helps you. Okay, this is the less interesting part of <laughs> our, uh, our get together. What's really interesting, I think, is this next thing that I want us to do, which is some writing. Um, and I, I do recommend for anybody following this and the recording, or if you know, the two of you here, if you can, and it works for you, I recommend writing by hand for this. And the reason I suggest that is I've done research on um, the way that your brain interacts and actually handwriting versus typing for some reason crosses the hemispheres in your brain and it, one brain, two hemispheres. Um, and it helps engage your creativity in a different way than just typing does. Now, I don't mean that in your life, you should be handwriting everything that you write creatively. I mean, I don't think many of us have time for that. But so like, for, I do this morning meditation writing prompt thing on weekday mornings, and I always handwrite for that. And it's a really different experience than what comes out when I'm typing. So because this is only five minutes, um, I just recommend you do that and, and see 
you know, does something different happen for you? And a lot of times if I'm stuck when I'm writing, I'll do one of these five minute um, prompts to myself because the pressure writing is what is really effective, I think, in um, creating like something new and surprising because you put the time pressure on you. And I was just thinking if I have, hold on a second, okay. So what we do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna woo woo us in a second, just have us breathe for a second and get ready to write. But before we do, I wanna talk about the process, which is a lot of times you get given this timed writing prompt and you don't know what to say, like your writer's block just goes, hey, no way. Um, and what you do is you just start writing, I don't know what to write over and over again. The shortest version of that you can think of because your brain will get irritated and bored very quickly and be like, fine, just write about this, you know? So one of the greatest ways, especially in a timed writing prompt to get over the writer's block is to start re repetitiously writing one sentence like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, or I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write. And, and by about the third time you're writing that down, your brain will be like, fine, here's something you can write. <laughs> So there are techniques you can use to try to get out of that writer's block. Um, there's something we call the five S's. One of them's kind of not an S, but I'll explain it. Um, and these are things you can think about as ways to entry into what you're writing about once I give you a prompt. And so they are setting, situation, sensory detail, um, Figurative language is not an S, but that's, I have an S that could go with that, but anyway, figurative language is your fourth S <laughs> and shift. So like at the, the end of what you're writing, as you're writing in the five minutes, I'll let you know when there's about a minute left. And that's when you should be like, oh, I need to shift or surprise my reader a little bit. So as you're writing, you know, do something that's surprising to you at the end of it. And that will be interesting for your reader and it will be interesting for you too. And, and I think I have the wrong journal here. And so one of the great ways to get into this is to possibly ask yourself a question. So think of it like as a movie director that's saying lights, camera, action. Either um, ask yourself a question think of a really intense little detail to start from, lights, camera, action, um, or have your character doing something. So like you can write about yourself, this can be nonfiction, or you can have a character. So if you have any fiction pieces in mind, you can do that. But also these prompts will be really funky. As I was telling Christine earlier, I just got my, my new teacher's edition of Metaphor Dice, and it's hilarious because they take, um, this, so the metaphor is a concept and it's the adjective plus the object. And so for example, the way they came, if I were to read a prompt from this for you to write about, the first one would be, your mother is a mad wedding gown, right? And you're like, <laughs> but they're really creative and that's something that you can write from. So um, we'll probably do one of those for the second prompt and I'll roll them so that they're different than what I read to you, Christine. But um, for the first prompt, I have, and I'll put, show me my word, thank you. For the first prompt, um, I'll put the prompt in the chat for you so you can look at it after I put it in there. Um, hmm. I have like six here and I just wanna pick a good one. Let's see, this one's too intimate. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the first one I want to write about um, because I want you to be thinking about what you want to do for your scenarios, right? So this one is really simple, but in the prompt, I'm going to put this story is about. Um, and then I'm going to add in one more little piece that you can or can't, like it's up to you if you want to use this or not. But um, I want to add one more little piece in here that your character or you could be thinking about. Um, and normally I don't give you the prompt like this, but I'm trying to give you some warm up time because this is our first time doing it. Um, 
you write about the story is about and then if you're writing in the third person you could say if she or if he had only known that or if you're writing in the first person if i had only known that this is about your character or if you're writing nonfiction now that's fine you're just going to have to fictionalize it for the class one last thing i need to emphasize as we're moving into this when you do write for this this course even if you have a novel in mind that you're writing from what you write for this course has to stand alone as a short story it has to have the full arc of a short story so even if it belongs in a novel it would need to be something that could be pulled out and submitted somewhere as a short story so it has to be all the way complete and stand alone as if the novel doesn't exist just for this class okay so <laughs> before we start one of the things that i do and I, I think this helps a lot is we just take a moment to breathe and then i'll baby basically say get ready set right and so um we're just going to take a couple of breaths in and breaths out i'll guide you through that and then i will get you started writing it'll be five minutes and i'll let you know when we're a minute out. okay so usually we'll breathe in through our noses first you know and then longer than that because i was talking <laughs> and then when you're comfortable breathe out through your mouth and then maybe close your eyes for just a second and breathe in through your nose Hold it at the top for just a little bit of a second longer than you want to, and then breathe out through your mouth. And when you think you're done breathing out, just breathe out like one or two more seconds. Breathe in through your nose. Hold it there for a second. And then as you breathe out through your mouth, think about what you want to start writing with and breathe out. And when you're ready, get started writing and I'll start the timer. And if you want to mute or turn your video off, whatever you're comfortable with, that's fine. I'm going to mute me. Go ahead and start writing.
You have about a minute left. Okay, do your best to wrap things up. So I feel like maybe that was a little generic. How did things go for you? Not that great. <laughs> <laughs> we have to, we could do three sessions. Let's see, let's see how things go for you, Heather. Well, I initially start, I'm like, the story is about, I'm like, you can't really, like, what do I start with? And then I just, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just like, do, 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 and just go and that's what I did but it started with inner thought situation right and uh -huh. then I kind of went out from there so it seemed to work good that way so I'm wondering would it be helpful if I just stopped and threw us into another prompt that was more specific um and you could keep going with the kind of ideas you had but do something new would that be better like, do you have a generic story starting up in your mind at all? I kind of did. Why don't, why don't, if, you, if you're comfortable, let's read what you have, and then we'll go forward from there. How's that sound? Okay. 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 So who wants to go first? I, I'll go first. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. This story is about the way things are. Sometimes things don't go as you plan them out. That happens a lot for me and I'm always trying to make my life easier, but it seems I just make everything harder. I should introduce myself. My name is Constance Smithson and I live on my own with two rescue dogs, Jake and Harry. I find myself sitting on my back patio with a coffee cup half full and my dog sunbathing in the rays. Everything seems like it's going to be okay today until I hear a scream and a sound like branches breaking and falling. Yeah, because you got to what the story is about when the five minutes was up. <laughs> yep. But what a nice shift and surprise at the end. <laughs> You're like, one minute, I'm like, oh crap, I got to put something in there. <laughs> I know, it just scared me. I was like, <gasps> <laughs> I'm like, this is not going anywhere. I got to put something. What is happening? <laughs> But do you see the value in like a compressed writing prompt and asking and telling you you have a minute left because you're like, oh, because <laughs> now we're and about like to discover. One, it's one sentence at the end. That's all it is. That yes, whole sentence is just one. I don't know how many, have you all heard the thing where like you write something and then they're like, just take away the first paragraph because you're just clearing your throat, you know? So like you were sort of clearing your throat. And if your next version of this started with, Constance heard branches breaking or, you know, like Constance watched Jake and I'm sorry, cause I had a dad named Jake. Was it Harry? Jake and Harry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Constance saw Jake and Harry leap to their feet as she heard the branches breaking and wondered what the hell is going on over there or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like you have a beginning of a story now and a lot of that backstory of what her name is by introducing herself and the two rescue dogs could exist 
in beginning in medias res with the action that you gave us at the end, right? That's what I mean by throat clearing. Like there's, there's other ways. And I mean, I do this all the time. Like I forgive myself a lot and let myself write very badly. And then I fix it. <laughs> Not that your writing was bad. I'm saying that I will do a lot of things that I know are throat clearing, but they give me the information I need to go back and then shape it into a better formed narrative. And in timed writing, I mean, almost always you're going to have a little throat clearing because your brain's like, what, what? We're writing? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was a great start. And the shift at the end was awesome. So Christine, you're up. I don't like what I wrote at all. I'm, st I literally, own, I'm still working on the clearing of my throat on this. <laughs> great. And I didn't so get very far. I only got like one paragraph down. What are you clearing your throat with? Okay, let me start. <laughs> This story is about Paris, about the croissant split over morning coffee, baguettes at every meal, sunsets over the Louvre, and love, specifically heartbreak. We begin with a girl, an American, who steps off the plane wearing a beret and the excited grin of a toddler on the playground. If she had only know that, known that during the summer she would meet the love of her life and lose him all in three months, she may not be as excited to be losing who she is right now. I feel like that's a fantastic beginning. <laughs> And the reason I do is that you give away the entire story and what's worthwhile for us is then watching it unspool and knowing what's coming. And you're going to make us believe that it really isn't going to be over, <laughs> but that it will be. And, you know, it's like watching Romeo and Juliet, right? We always know how it's going to end yet. Somehow we're just hopeful this time, you know, that he will realize that she, you know, wasn't dead, but that she was sleeping, but it never happened. Yeah. I don't think that's throat clearing in that case. I think that's a technique for beginning a story. Um, and you could have begun with her breaking, you know, croissants in half and having coffee and thinking this in the background, but I don't think you have to. I mean, I think you set the reader up for, do you want to read a heartbreak story? Because this is one. Which I, you know, I, as somebody who's been teaching this class for a while, I was like, oh, is she going to be a romance writer? And then the next sentence, you're like, and heartbreak. And I'm like, nope. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't, we don't do sustained heartbreak. We do temporary heartbreak in romance, right? That was a really great start, both of you. I'm very impressed with what you came up with because that was an incredibly generic prompt. And I don't usually give this generic of a prompt. I mean, in fact, in the prompt I wished I had, and I don't know why I didn't do this one this time, so I'm going to write it from memory really quick in the chat, is so I'm basically going to say you or your character um, keeps more than underwear in your top drawer. Have you or your character <laughs> I'm um, open the top drawer. What else is there, like present there? And why is it meaningful? Use sensory detail. Okay, I wanna write this one because now each of you has a character. You have Constance, you have, did you give her her name? No, I haven't. Yeah, okay. You have Paris girl, you have Bray girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. She has a top drawer where she's staying in Paris. Constance has heard this crashing sound. But now all I'm asking you to do, probably the reason I didn't do this is I usually do this on the character development um, module, but we'll do it again or something. Um, now I want you both to tell me more about this character by exploring the top drawer with them. So um, basically go into Constance's bedroom, go into the hotel room or the Airbnb or wherever she's staying for her three months and open the top drawer and what do you find, right? Can you do that? Okay, so you or your character keeps more than underwear in your top drawer. Have you or your character opened the top drawer? What else is in there? Why is it meaningful? Use sensory detail as you tell us. Ready, get set, right.
You have about a minute left. Okay, start wrapping things up. We've lost Heather. <laughs> there she is. So how to go this time? Was that a little bit more specific and fun? Yes, I had more fun writing that. Okay. How to work for you, Heather? It worked really good. Oh, good. Okay. So um, should we reverse it? Should we start with yeah. Christine this time? Yes, I feel more confident <laughs> in what I wrote. <laughs> okay. This time. Uh, she unpacks her suitcase and slides her things from home to keep her company uh, in while she's abroad into the top drawer. There's the framed picture of her and her best friend, Margaret, sitting in the weeping willow on campus, crest whitening strip smiles sparkling in the afternoon sun while they sip toxic mixes from so solo cups. The porcelain owl her grandmother had given her just before she died and made her promise to see the world. The new leather journal her father gave her to write her down her adventures. And lastly, the diamond ring Josh gave her right before she walked through security at Logan Airport, the ring she still can't seem to wear. Oh, oh, and she's about to fall in love with somebody else. <laughs> I'm very interested. How about you, Heather? You're, you're still, you're muted. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, I love that we have names like Margaret and Josh. Uh, I love that her grandmother told her to see the world. So there's like a reason she's there beyond just kind of randomly seeing the world, but more like a, uh, what's the word when somebody like mandates that you go see the world? You know, she's doing what her grandma said. And then the leather journal from her father suggests that, you know, she's highly supported by her family, which is, I don't think, common for the people who show up in Paris trying to have an adventure with a beret. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Heather? I, I think there's two kinds of people. You either go there to explore and just like see, be the touristy type, or you do that part where you're like, I'm looking for somebody and I am going to a foreign country to find them. That's what that sounds yeah. like. <laughs> Although Josh, like she, she took the ring. She has the ring with her. I said, wow. Josh was trying to like stake his real estate before she left, so. <laughs> which is a horrible way to put that. Um, one of the things that I would ask that uh, I will ask you to try to do off the cuff really quick uh, is what are a couple of the sensory details so we know a little bit what things look like. Can you tell me what something smelled like? Um, well, the leather journal smells like new leather. Yeah, good. And then what does something feel like? like texture-wise? Um, like the smooth porcelain. Yeah, and those were the two places I would have expected you to like, since I said use sensory detail, those are the places where you might've easily used sensory detail. 
Um, but also you could have done something like have the drawer stick when she tried to get it open because it's probably, you know, like an older place that she's in. Or um, one of the things that we do as writers is we tend to give visuals, you know, so we know what color things are. We kind of know what things look like. And we tend to give sound. Sound is something that comes easily to us. But of course, we have five senses. So um, smell, taste, and touch are the other three that usually don't get as much attention. And one of the fun things that you can do in your writing is called synesthesia, which is where you might have one sense stand in for the other. So you might even have your character say she could almost taste the smell of new leather coming off the journal. So those are ways to really spark up your reader's experience of the senses that are happening in your writing because you're, you know, because we all, I mean, I think we do anyway, can taste the smell of new leather journal, right? I mean, I know what that tastes like in my mouth, even though it really isn't a taste. So that's just some creative things I want to encourage you all to think about. You don't have to use them, but synesthesia is one of my favorite ways to shake up the senses as well. Cool. Great start. Heather, what'd you get? I slid open the drawer to my sorry, I'm like blinding myself here with this <laughs> backlight. I'm like, I can't see. A little more light for myself. Okay. okay. I slid open the drawer to my dresser with my dry hand, trying not to drip water from my hair everywhere. There was the section of neatly folded underwear lying down one side of the drawer. In the middle, I keep my keepsake boxes. One is a pewter round tin that has two lily pads and a frog solder on top. It has that discolored look to it that things sometimes get after being around for so long. Next to it is my jewelry dish full of rings in too many sizes that I keep buying and never wear. Next to it, underneath the neat row of folded socks, is my Smith & Wesson loaded and ready to go. I reach for it. Oh, I like Very that. Nice. <laughs> that, was, that was a nice turn of events there. <laughs> it's funny because I almost... Like, and I don't, I'm sure it's because I'm married to him. I'm sure I was like, there's going to be a gun. I know there is. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for thinking that, but I already thought, and I can't explain why I already thought Constance was a kind of tough character like that. Like somebody, I guess, because of the action you chose. Um, I'm thinking that like, she's not somebody who's going to flail and go, oh no, they were breaking branches. Like I already pictured her with her rescue dogs. Like somebody who can take charge of a situation. So yeah, yeah, nice. I liked the idea, like the detail of knowing that there were two lily pads and a frog and that somehow, like in my brain, I made it another, um, and this is this is a great thing that you do when you're writing, right? Like your, your reader will interact and, and take the description you give and do more with it, right? So like in my brain, it was like one of those cracked surface, almost porcelain things again, that you would twist open the keepsake thing. I have no idea. I was thinking of something I got from Korea, but that it was aged in the way that, you know, because the glaze gets that older look to it. I don't know if I'm right, but I wanted you to know what happened when I heard it. And then I love the rings in too many sizes that because you said that my brain took off in all kinds of directions. Does she, does she gain and lose weight? Does she want to put them on different fingers? Does she, you know, like, why does she never wear them? Like, cause I have a whole drawer full of rings. I don't wear either. Cause I think my sister looks beautiful when she puts all these rings on her fingers and I'm like, Oh, I want to do that. And I never do. <laughs> so like, I really related to your details. Like in both cases, both of you had really great details that, you know, fired up my imagination. what do you think, Christine? Oh no. I thought the details were really good. And like I said, I like the, I, I actually pictured her more of like an Ellen, Eleanor Oliphant kind of character, like kind oh. of just like lonely and like by themselves. And so for me, the whole, it, she's reaching for her gun kind of took me aback. Cause that's just not how I pictured her. And oh, so I really cool. enjoyed that. <laughs> and Heather, have you read Eleanor Oliphant is perfectly fine? No. It's a really cool book. <laughs> I am. I do miss my reading. <laughs> I and really Oliphant, love it a lot. Oliphant is like O L I T H A N T. Yeah, um, and I do almost all my reading by audiobook now because my working life is physical reading, um, and I can I can vouch for the narrator of Olive, Eleanor Oliphant. It's she's really good. <laughs> 
And uh, if we're doing book recommendations, three more audiobooks I loved that I think would be great physical books too are Kate Atkinson's Life After Life. Um, and all of these kind of play with time and quant quantum mechanics like and like realms. I mean, I'm really interested in that. Uh, Kate Morton's The Clockmaker's Daughter and <laughs> and Matthew Haig's The Midnight Library. So those are all, um, they're pretty popular right now. So I'm not, I'm not straying into strange territory, but I like them all very much. And then I actually just physically read, because um, I'm working on my memoir and I think that she was a great example to work from. This is Emily Rapp's Poster Child. And it's a really good memoir. Um, she's born basically so that she has to live life with a prosthetic leg. It's the premise of the memoir. She has a, another one called Sanctuary that I'm getting ready to read that's going to be super sad because it's about her child that um, was born with one of those aging diseases and didn't live very long. So, um, But I took it and did you know, uh, reading like a writer with it where... I was paying attention to where she was doing scene and exposition and what the themes of her paragraphs were and how she was using sensory detail in it. And then I took my own idea from my opening of my book and kind of wrote it over here to match up with what she was doing to like mimic her method. And it was amazing what turned out in my own writing. So I just want to recommend that sometimes just trying to mimic somebody works. <laughs> So uh, this is such an amazing start. You both had great writing. So I, I know I only helped you with one story idea. Um, I want to also, I rolled the dice for us in case we were going to do the dice. And um, it came out, memory is a handed down superhero. <laughs> I'll put that in the chat. So if you want more That's writing, <laughs> I know, right? That's awesome. <laughs> It makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't, <laughs> but then when you have to make sense of it to put it in writing somewhere, it's so fun what happens with your brain because you're like, well, you know, memory can be a superhero because sometimes the past holds us together with great memories, but it's handed down like, oh my gosh, like, you know, how did it get handed down to me? Am I getting something happy out of somebody else's memory? You know, like I, my brain went crazy when I rolled this for you all. So it's kind of fun. Um, but that's something you could take into your writing if you want after we finish the session, you know, if that's fun for you. And I'll give you one more roll. Why wouldn't I, right? Oh, it didn't roll enough. Okay. Oh, dear. Um, oh, I can't imagine what well, we'll go with this one, but it would be your mother is a bright blessing. What is it with this your mother diet? Like, why did they... Why did they so, I mean, he, so Taylor and Molly took a bunch of, he's calling them concepts, mother, father, one of them is my father, memory is, happiness, poetry, the future, my heart, my soul, like these are all concepts, right? So like happiness is a bright blessing. And then he takes an adjective, bright, glorified, gentle, unspoken, mad, um, and then he takes an object, which is a blessing, a party clown, a wedding gown, brand new toy, meadow. Happiness is a mad meadow. <laughs> and what's fun about it is, um, you know, we wouldn't think to put these things together. And I feel like it's figurative language synesthesia. Like synesthesia is the wrong word for it because we're not changing out senses, but you're doing the same thing. You're taking these things that don't necessarily belong together. And when you string them together and ask yourself to write about them, all kinds of creative things happen in your mind. Like you maybe get less linear and less plot driven and write to a concept like this. And it doesn't mean you'll ever use any of it, but it opens up possibilities in all the other writing that you do, you know, by writing about this one thing. I've been having a blast. So I accidentally bought the Erudite edition. <laughs> It's my first set of metaphor dice, and they're a little crazy. Like, um, isolation is an ill-gotten disguise. <laughs> so, I think that the regular metaphors are a great way to start, and maybe at the end of the term, we'll try out some of the erudite ones, but I have more fun with the regular ones right now. 
anyway, so I do want to encourage, like, if you're having any kind of writer's block or you're having trouble coming up with ideas for what to write about, um, you dig around for some prompts online if you want or whatever, but set a clock for five minutes. Tell yourself lights, action, camera. Use one of those three techniques. Either look intensely at something, that's the lights. Camera is like, um, maybe go into the scene or ask a question. And then action is have your character doing an action. Like pick one of those three ways to start. Give yourself five minutes and you have to write it in five minutes. And it's amazing put under pressure, your brain will do different things for you. Instead of just kind of, I like to just sort of wallow around and write as block, but I, nobody has time for that anymore. So now I've developed this pressure technique to get myself writing so that I'm not wasting my time. And it really does work. So at least for me, and I hope it will for you and for anybody who ends up watching the video, I'm going to stop recording now because we've reached the end of what we're doing class-wise. So um, thank you for playing with everybody recording.